Welcome to the Taylor Report, CIUT 89.5 FM. I'm Phil Taylor, your host. And today our guest is going to be Zafar Bengash of Crescent International. It's crescent.icit digital.org. Actually, just write Zafar Bengash and you will be able to locate him. Zafar, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Phil. It's my great pleasure to be with you. Well, I think in Canada, we cannot find someone better qualified than yourself um, because we, we want to talk about Afghan news from Afghanistan, uh, the story of the uh, hasty departure of the Americans and the uh, apparently the assuming of power uh, by the Taliban. And I should tell our listeners, uh, you, of course, are from that region yourself uh, and have lived with this subject now for so many years. And, and I guess the first question, uh, since the Taliban is now on everybody's tongue, nobody actually knows what they're talking about. They say Taliban, Taliban. I noticed the prime minister said today uh, he won't recognize them. Uh, he hasn't decided uh, what they're gonna do because the Taliban is a listed in Canada or uh, internationally as terrorists, um, Taliban has a long history and there is a, the, it's being discussed this way. The people who follow closely say this is not your grandfather's Taliban or your, or your father's Taliban. Uh, this is something new and not, it's certainly not the Taliban that people usually think they're referring to. Is that accurate? Who, who, are, what is, who is this group of leaders and uh, how do you think uh, they should be viewed from Canada? And then I'd like to know, of course, what your view is, what your take is on the, the countries in the neighborhood, what they are saying, Iran, China, Russia, uh, India. Yes, uh, well, uh, thank you for um, uh, inviting me to the program. Um, the, the Taliban, uh, actually the word Taliban is a plural for Talib. Um, and Talib is somebody who is a, it's a, it's a Persian Pashto word, which means a, a student at a religious seminary. So essentially, these are uh, people that emerged from uh, religious schools in uh, Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And uh, of course, you know, from our, our modern perspective, we would view them as being very conservative in outlook, but it's important to keep in mind that the society in Afghanistan, generally speaking, is a very conservative society. And I think we should not be uh, demanding of the Taliban or of the Afghan people uh, the same values that we hold here. Uh, of course, they are, as I mentioned, they are a, it's a conservative society, it's a tribal society, and in that sense, uh, the Taliban represent the, the sentiments and values, whether they are cultural or political or religious values of the overwhelming majority of the people in Afghanistan. Now, the question that you asked whether they are the same Taliban that were there in 1996 to 2001 and uh, today, 2021, I would say that the answer to that question is no, they are not the same people. In fact, they have evolved they have become a lot more aware of um, how they ought to be conducting themselves. They no longer are the group that were, um, in fact, quite um, uh, you know, harsh in, in their early uh, incarnation. But in the 20 year period since 2001, they have evolved considerably. They have become much more sophisticated in fact, I would say that this designation of them as a terrorist organization is completely false. Unfortunately, there is a tendency in the West that anybody 
who opposes Western hegemony, Western imperialism, they are automatically terrorists. And we can make a quick comparison, for instance, with this group called the MKO, the Mujahideen Khalq Organization, which is actually a terrorist organization. It, it is responsible for killing more than 17,000 people in Iran, 1,200 of whom were leaders of Iran, prime minister, president, chief justice, ministers, members of parliament, uh, academics, scholars, etc. And yet, although in the early period they were designated as a terrorist organization by the US and its Western allies, then in 2009, the European Union took them off their list of terrorist organizations. And in 2012, the US took them off their terrorist list because now they saw the MKO as being useful to them to advance Western agenda, which was, of course, uh, aggression, uh, undermining Iran and uh, trying to uh, destroy uh, Iran's uh, political and economic structure. So when we look at the Taliban, the matter in which they have, um, first of all, they, they confronted the US and its allies for 20 years. This is a remarkable you know, group of people that have resisted uh, US imperialism. Secondly, no organization, no group can succeed in any struggle unless and until they have the support of the people. It would have been impossible for the Taliban to have succeeded in Afghanistan if they did not enjoy the, the, the support of the overwhelming majority of the people in Afghanistan. Regrettably, the images that we get are only from Kabul, which of course is very different from the rest of the country in Afghanistan. And so it would be very inaccurate to look at what is happening in Kabul, although you know, since the, the Taliban took over control in Kabul on uh, August the 15th, uh, all the media reports and all the other reports that I have received, they say that um, situation is uh, returning to normal. There has been uh, there have been no attacks against people. There have been there has been no vengeance. There have been no other kinds of activities that that should raise any concerns whatsoever. And I'm not sure whether uh, you saw the, their interview, the interview of a Taliban representative on Tuesday, August the 17th. They they clearly there are several things that stand out. Number one, they said that we offer general amnesty to everybody, even those people that collaborated with the US or its allies. We are not going to exact revenge. I think this was very remarkable. They said, we are not in the business of seeking revenge. We are all Afghans and we now need, the, the war is over. We need, need to turn a page, we need to move on. Secondly, despite this vile propaganda against them that they are shutting down girls' schools and uh, locking up women and girls at homes, they said, we want the girls and uh, to continue their education. We want women to continue work that they are doing in various ministries. They even went to the extent of saying that we want women to join our cabinet. And so I think based on that, we can begin to see that they are a very different group today than they were 20 years ago. And this is how I think we should look at them. Of course, we need to see whether they are going to keep their word or not. But from what we have seen so far over the last few days, they have maintained their word. They have conducted themselves in a very, very proper professional manner. And I think that's how we should be viewing them rather than with these jaundiced eyes that, that the image that we had of the Taliban of 20 years ago. Yeah, that's very striking. I agree. I noticed that the, the, the West, uh, particularly the media, are, are practically in a stunned condition. They really don't know how to report this. Um, they, they have to show the image and there are the Taliban leaders being appearing on Afghan television, being interviewed by uh, women interviewers, by uh, professional broadcasters who are women. And that's, that tells you an awful lot. I mean, if, if, their, if their policy were to be say, oh, we're gonna do something about this, they would be doing the opposite. Um, and the story, we should, I think, spend a little time on this issue since it's on every paper. 
that everyone here says, oh, what about the women? But this is very at <laughs> the height of hypocrisy. Isn't it? I, we have been supporting uh, terrorists, certainly in Syria, most notably, where extremists uh, who are determined to have male oppression of, uh, of, uh, of the women of Syrian society, brutalizing them. Uh, we have Saudi Arabia, of course, as a friend of Canada and a friend of the United States. And to contrast this with what's going on in Afghanistan, there's nothing comparable in terms of where we put our support so it's, it strikes me as the height of hypocrisy for people to claim they're very worried about the women. Exactly. I think this is the problem that, um, you know, since uh, the atmosphere uh, has been so much poisoned against the Taliban, that for 20 years they were vilified, they were being presented as terrorists, as oppressors of women, et cetera, et cetera, that now, both the media as well as Western governments are totally stunned uh, when they have found that the Taliban have, first of all, defeated another superpower, proving once again that Afghanistan has always been a graveyard of empires. And uh, the only thing that they can cling to is this notion of women. As you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, these, uh, these ISIS terrorists in Syria are oppressing women, they are terrorizing women, and yet, um, here we are, and, and again, as you mentioned, in Saudi Arabia, which is a close ally of the United States as well as of Canada, Canada is supplying $15 billion worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia. Why aren't these things being discussed and brought out, and why is Canada not stopping its weapon sales to Saudi Arabia? What about the oppression of women in Saudi Arabia? But, you know, unfortunately, these are the kinds of you know, situations that we face um, uh, in, in the world today that if somebody is perceived as being uh, the West's enemy, and of course the Taliban are, you know, being vilified because they happen to defeat uh, another superpower. And this is something that the West simply cannot fathom, that how can these ragtag band of people armed only with Kalashnikovs and nothing else can be so determined to be able to fight off a superpower for 20 years. I would invite your listeners to read the report that the United States government itself has uh, presented. In fact, one report, the latest uh, uh, report for 2021 was, uh, which is referred to as uh, SEGAR's report, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. This is a the body that was created in the United States in 2008 to evaluate America's reconstruction progress in Afghanistan. And the latest report, which was published on August the 17th of this year, this month, uh, it, just a few days ago, in that they point out that right from the word go, and they evaluated right from the early period, the kind of mind boggling uh, incompetence, the kind of total detachment from reality in Afghanistan, the kind of you know, uh, statements that were being made internally in White House meetings, in Pentagon meetings, in which American generals were saying, we don't know who, the, who a friend and enemy is in Afghanistan. We don't know what our mission is. And, you know, and then they were being told, okay, you have got to spend this money for building schools and hospitals and clinics. And they said that there was this rush to build all of these things, but they had no clue whether there would be anybody coming to study in those schools. And there were literally dozens of schools opened in various places that just, the buildings that just sat there, there was nobody to study. Similarly with, with, um, uh, with, with clinics, medical clinics, et cetera, all it did was it spawned a culture of corruption. So much so that billions upon billions of dollars were basically pocketed by these warlords in Afghanistan that were linked with successive governments since 2002. And you know, just a few days ago when uh, the American installed president Ashraf Ghani fled Afghanistan on Sunday, August the 15th, 
he took with him $168 million in cash. Yeah. There was more money, but they couldn't stuff it in the helicopter that was taking him from the presidential palace. So they <laughs> left it right there on the grounds of the presidential palace. <laughs> this is documented. This is not something that I'll say. I mean, this is the kind of, and, and of course, his, uh, you know, his, his advisor for national security, he also stole hundreds of millions of dollars and fled the country. And of course, Ashraf Ghani has now ended up in uh, Abu Dhabi. And the Abu Dhabi government issued a statement today, August the 18th. They said, we are giving him refuge on humanitarian grounds. <laughs> yes. I would say that perhaps it is much more to do with the hundreds of millions of dollars he's bringing to Abu Dhabi. And of course, Ashraf Ghani has a lot of property in Abu Dhabi. And these are the kinds of horrible corruption that was taking place in Afghanistan under America's watch. Now, Seagar's report, the latest report, uh, they admitted that they, the U.S. has spent a total of 920, 933 billion dollars in Afghanistan on military uh, effort or their military campaign. And there is another 400 and God knows how many 459 or something billion dollars on other so-called projects, etc. Overall, they have spent more than $2.26 trillion in the last 20 years. Now that's, these are mind boggling figures. Yes. And if we consider, I mean, I've said this before and I'll say this again, if the Americans had simply given this money and distributed among the 38, 40 million Afghans, each Afghan would have got, I don't know, something like, you know, let's do the math very, very quickly. I think each of Ghan would have got something like $55 million per person. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now that's, you know, sorry, that they would have got five, uh, yeah, $55 million per person. That's a mind boggling figure. Yeah. And these Afghans would be extremely rich, but here we have a situation in which America has spent $2.26 trillion and all it has faced is a failed military mission. They achieved nothing. They had, in fact, no, no clear objective as to what is it that they wanted to achieve. And that uh, they were basically, uh, you know, spending money. A lot of the American uh, contractors became rich. Uh, money was being wasted. There was absolutely nothing that they were achieving from this. Oh, this, it is. Uh, uh, <clears throat> It shows you, I guess, uh, we, how determined America is. And they do tend to throw money at things as a way to, people will grovel for money. I hate to say it, but it, uh, they buy someone like Mr. Ghani and um, call him a president and they have to spend a fortune. And now they've come up with a handful of dust as a result. And I have to ask you, this man's history is so, curious. Uh, Professor Khalil, University of California, said he remembers him from the American University of Beirut, where he said he told people he was a Marxist and a socialist. He seems to have a lot of hats. But here he ends up, and he also wrote a book, Fixing Failed States. And, he, and, he, and you've probably seen this. In the Los Angeles Times, I think it was in 1980 seven, maybe 97, he wrote an article about uh, the Russians have gone and their puppets are going to fall. And now he's, he's in the United Arab Emirates, which is, I guess it's not a republic, right? No. <laughs> uh, and, and you notice the Americans have, uh, I was, uh, again, I was looking at Charmaine Narwani, who has a new uh, website called thecradle.co. Um, and she, she points out they've dropped him like a hot rock. I mean, once you are no longer of use to them, they, they actually don't care what happens to you. Um, but I have to uh, ask you, this thing about how are the states in the area? And I, number one, the Islamic Republic uh, responding. I, I have seen a press 
TV interview, and I don't know if this, the person being interviewed, I guess that's the second part of the question, is do we, do we have a definitive identified leadership? But the gentleman speaking, and he was uh, an, uh, of, of some status, he said he was asked directly the, the key question that for many of us is what is the view of the Taliban towards Wahhabism? Because when the Americans went in with most bloodthirsty way, their allies were the Wahhabis. And they attempted to create a Shia Sunni war. People talk about Russia, but it was also the second part of the strategy was a, to try to get Muslims to fight Muslims. And a key player was the, were the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and of course the ideology of Wahhab, Wahhabism. What do you think of his remarks? And isn't this a I'd call it a hopeful sign, but do you think it is going to be the path they will follow? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, the Taliban leader uh, who uh, answered that question obviously clearly indicated that they do not want uh, Wahhabis in Afghanistan because um, they see Wahhabism as a, an ideology uh, that presents itself as being a religious, uh, you know, ideology, but uh, it has actually, it is at the root of all of the problems in the Muslim world. Uh, much of this um, conflict that uh, has been going on in the Muslim world is actually uh, created as a result of this extremist ideology of Wahhabism. But I want to come to this broader question of uh, Afghanistan's neighbors because um, they are and have been most impacted by whatever has gone on in Afghanistan, not just over the last 20 years, but over the last 43 years. Yes. And two neighbors in particular have been very badly affected number one, Pakistan, and number two, Iran. Both of them have had to house at least three million Afghan refugees for more than 40 years. Now that's a lot of burden for these countries and their economies without any help from outside. Now I want to draw the attention of your listeners to the fact that a few days ago, when an American military plane was taking off from Kabul International Airport, there were these Afghans who were supposedly America's allies, people that had worked as translators and other support staff for the American military, the Canadian military, et cetera. Some of them were clinging to that plane, military plane. And the pilot knew that that's the situation. The ground crew knew, the American army, which is in control of Kabul International Airport, knew that. And yet, these people, Afghans that were clinging to the plane, the plane took off and they all fell to their death, seven of them. So the first deaths that occurred after the Taliban took over Afghanistan were Afghans, but killed by Americans. Previously, they used to drop bombs to kill them, and now they drop them from the planes. I mean, they knew that these people are clinging to the plane. Why did the plane take off? And they, there were also Afghans, actually, that had gone into the wheel carriages. And when the wheels, of course, folded once the plane took off, they were crushed to death. And when the plane landed, these bodies fell off from there. So this is the kind of mistreatment that the Americans indulge in of the people that they said they were our allies. And there are still thousands of you know, Afghans that uh, had served the Canadian military. And you know, Canada is now you know, playing this sort of you know, game that somehow they care for the Afghans and, 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 and the Afghan women, et cetera, their education. Okay, if that's the case, please bring these people over to Canada. Why are you sort of, you know, dragging your feet? Why are you taking so much time? These are people that were allied with you. But let me say that the Taliban have appealed to these people. They said, 
don't go please this is your country you you need to serve your country nobody is going to harm you and they have not harmed anybody in fact they have issued a decree saying nobody should be entering anybody's house to search for anything this now the war is over we need to move on from here and i think these are positive steps that the, the taliban have taken and unfortunately the us and its allies are even mistreating the people that served them for 20 years or or thereabouts and and not really giving them the dignity that they deserve if they really care for these people they should let them come what like you know there was on one uh, one flight american flight they had put in this is this was a, a military cargo flight they had stuffed 640 afghans men women and children they were sort of you know they were packed like sardines into that plane i don't know how they like there were no seats nothing people were just stuffed in and they sat on the floor and they were there because you know they they wanted to get out of there and there have been totally chaotic scenes at uh, kabul international airport uh, you know people uh, climbing up over stairs to get into the planes people sitting on top of planes I mean, this was just total chaos over there, and yeah. so we see that the people that served the Americans, although I mean, I think it's something that we need to ask ourselves: if suppose, let's say, uh, Russia had occupied Canada, and Canadians had collaborated with the Russians, and if the Russians had finally been defeated and driven out, I think let's ask ourselves the simple question: what would the canadian government have then done to these collaborators i think the answer is very clear we know from the second world war what what people did to the collaborators in france and uh, netherlands and uh, other countries you know in europe so i think here is a situation whereby the taliban these much vilified people primitive so called primitive people are saying forget about the past we need to move on we are not going to take revenge from anybody so i think we need to judge them on that rather than continuing to live in the past and continuing to accuse them of this or that atrocity when they have actually done nothing wrong with yes. respect to you know uh, afghanistan's neighbors as i mentioned both iran and and pakistan have suffered tremendously and uh, naturally they are very anxious to see that afghanistan settles down but i'm very glad to say that the taliban have become very sophisticated they did not fall for the trap to create this shia sunni conflict that i think the americans were hoping for they, they, the taliban played it very very in a very sophisticated manner they have maintained good rela- in fact because of iran's very sensible policy they have uh, been able to develop and cultivate good relations with the taliban they have been taliban representatives visiting iran to sit down and discuss things uh yes. pakistan has also been trying to um you know facilitate uh, intra afghan dialogue so that the country can move forward with all the various groups uh, being represented in a future government and one other uh, very very important uh, development has been that a proposal was made by hamid karzai who is the former president he suggested that there should be because ashraf ghani has fled the country there should be a coordinating council which would consist of of course um former afghan government officials as well as the taliban that would work out a uh, an arrangement whereby uh, develop a a policy or how the the future government is going to be formed and the taliban have ex- accepted that and let me tell you who are from the uh, from the non taliban side the people that are in that coordinating council it's uh, abdullah abdullah who was essentially a uh, acting as you know ashraf ghani's deputy uh, hamid karzai the former president gulbuddin hikmatyar a former uh, guerrilla leader and head of hizb e islami uh, and the taliban have said we want to sit down with various afghan groups and factions so that we can chalk out a strategy so that we can establish a government that would uh, you know rep- represent all of the people and so that particular uh, council is now functioning one other point which is important is that within the taliban 
Shura Council, which means the governing council, they have not, the Taliban, of course, are predominantly Pashtun, the, you know, the, the predominant group, ethnic group in Afghanistan. But they have, they have within their Shura Council, they have the Tajiks, who are 20% of Afghan's population. They have Uzbeks, who represent about maybe 6 to 7%. They have Hazaras, who another maybe 10%, these are Shias. They've got all of these various ethnic groups in their governing council. That means that they have matured. They have realized that we cannot rule Afghanistan on our own. We cannot ignore others. We have to work with all of them. And we also have to take all of them along with us. And that was the reason why the Taliban were able to take over the entire country, which is something like 270, 280,000 square miles of territory within two weeks. I mean, no, no army, no group, no guerrilla group can you know, take over that vast territory by fighting. What this meant was that they were able to reach out to the people and tell them there is no point in fighting. We, we see this is a corrupt regime over there. They have not done anything for the people. We need to you know, get rid of it and then establish a system of governance which would be acceptable to everybody, which would represent everybody, not just the, the Pashtuns in Afghanistan. I think these are positive developments and we should give them an opportunity to see how they proceed further. If they do something wrong, by all means, we should criticize them. But if they haven't done anything wrong, if they are doing things that are positive that we, we support, then I think we should give them a, a chance, let them prove themselves. And so far, I would say that since they, they took over Kabul, or even prior to that, their conduct has been very noble, very proper. They haven't harmed anybody. And I think that's a positive development that we should welcome. Yes. They, as a matter of fact, when you people use the word terrorist, but you have to put that aside because uh, they, as you say, they have not been harming people. They've actually been building a coalition that is not the practice of the, those elements Islamic extremists who, who attack Libya, attack Syria, uh, who uh, they, they play an, an entirely sectarian card and uh, attack Christians, attack Shia, uh, attack uh, elements, uh, Islamic elements don't agree with them. And so, uh, and this isn't actually news, is it? I mean, you mentioned the Islamic Republic has actually been talking to them for some time now, as have the other neighbors, I gather. And I'd be curious to know, how is Pakistan, for example? Uh, what's their relations like? Have they met with them? And what's their take? OK, now there are um, uh, several aspects that we need to uh, look at one by one. As far as the Islamic Republic of Iran is concerned, it has maintained uh, a political dialogue with the Taliban, uh, as far as I'm aware, as far back as 2012 to 2014. So they have been in touch with them. They have uh, Taliban leaders have visited Iran, and uh, uh, you know officials from Iran have visited Afghanistan, even while uh, America was in occupation of Afghanistan. But Western Afghanistan, of course, was outside the control of uh, American military presence. So it was possible for uh, officials from the Islamic Republic of Iran to visit Western uh, Afghanistan and meet the Taliban representatives. And of course, you know, Iran uh, had, uh, has invested uh, heavily in that region, developing um, various infrastructure projects, for instance, railway lines, and, and other infrastructure in that region. Secondly, with respect to Pakistan, Pakistan has maintained uh, relations with the Taliban, but Pakistan has maintained relations with all of the various groups. Uh, with, in fact, you know, a few days ago, there was a 20 member delegation of various Afghan leaders that visited Pakistan. This is not the Taliban delegation, uh, this was other Afghans that included Tajiks and Hazaras and Uzbeks and so on. And uh, the Pakistani foreign minister welcomed them and he sat with them and he said that we in Pakistan uh, would like to see uh, 
a, a government that are, emerges in Afghanistan through dialogue and a government that would be inclusive. And, and Pakistan has been very clear uh, all along. Uh, in fact, uh, throughout the war in Afghanistan, Pakistan's position had been that there is no military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. And now uh, the Americans are also saying that, although previously the Americans would threaten Pakistan, that, you know, but when you say that, you are really backing the Taliban. Well, Pakistan said that, look, you need to understand Afghanistan's history. You need to understand the mindset of the Afghan people. Nobody has ever uh, subdued them. Although they, you know, Pakistan was always accused of backing the Taliban, that's why the Americans were not doing so good, uh, which actually suggested that somehow Pakistan is a superpower that just because of its support, the Taliban are able to defeat the American army. But let's ask ourselves, well, you know, when Alexander the Great invaded Afghanistan, there was no Pakistan. So I don't know why the, the Alexander the Great was defeated by the Afghans. Or when the British were there during the 19th century, uh, there was no Pakistan, and yet the, uh, the Afghans were able to defeat the British. So basically, the Afghan people, by their very nature, have never, ever accepted foreign domination. This is in their nature. And I think after defeating the Americans, it should now send a clear message to all uh, countries that harbor imperialist ambitions that, you know, stay away from Afghanistan unless you want to be defeated. Because that's absolutely clear. They will simply not accept foreign domination. No matter how primitive they may be, no matter how poor they may be, they will not accept anybody else's dictation. They would like to sort out their own things on their own. And I think now there is an opportunity. Uh, and I see this time that I, I'm, I feel much more optimistic. Uh, back in, you know, once the, uh, back in 1996 to 2001, there was still, you know, a lot of difficulties with, uh, you know, the way the Taliban conducted themselves. But today they have matured politically, they have matured diplomatically, they have reached out to all their neighbors, they have had delegations sent to Russia, to China, uh, of course, you know, to other countries, to the Central Asian Republics, etc. And the Chinese have already indicated that they would like to work with the Taliban once a government is established in Afghanistan. So far, the Taliban have refrained from announcing a government. They are saying that once the foreign forces are out of our country, then we will announce a government. But in the meantime, they are holding negotiations and discussions with various groups so that uh, they can uh, establish, uh, work towards establishing an all-inclusive government. So yeah. now we see that uh, the two most important neighbors of Afghanistan, Iran and Pakistan, are on the same page. And the two uh, economic and military powers in the region, Russia and China, are also uh, on board uh, with, with this scheme. Uh, it's indicative that the Russians have not shut down their embassy. The Chinese have not shut down their embassy. They have not evacuated their, their diplomatic personnel. They see no reason why they should do so, because the Taliban have given assurances to all diplomatic staff that we will protect you, we guarantee your protection and safety and security because it is our responsibility. And yet, you know, the Americans uh, are fleeing the country because they see that they have obviously uh, a lot of wrongs that they have done in Afghanistan and they are not confident that, uh, you know, uh, their wrongdoings would not be exposed. So you can see the, the situation that is emerging that uh, America and its allies are fleeing Afghanistan, uh, including, of course, India, because India had uh, done a lot of dirty tricks in Afghanistan as well. India has withdrawn all of its so-called diplomatic staff, although I insist that they were, the large number of them were not diplomats, they were Indian intelligence agents carrying out, uh, you know, subversive activities from Afghanistan soil against Pakistan. And yet we see that, you know, countries like Pakistan, Iran, uh, uh, Russia, China, they have not withdrawn their diplomatic staff. They, are, they still exist in Kabul and in, the, in their various consulates. And they continue to function without any hindrance, which indicates that, uh, you know, the, the diplomatic staff is safe. 
uh, and, and other people that are in Afghanistan that may not be Afghans are quite safe. Nobody has said anything to them. They have even invited the media. They have told the media, you continue functioning. Uh, and, and, you know, by all means, criticize us if we do anything wrong. But yeah. please do not promote any, any foreign agenda in the country because that's not something that we are going to tolerate. So you see that there is a new situation that has emerged in Afghanistan, which I think is a positive development. It, it is phenomenal to watch. So speaking to Zafar Bengash, Crescent International, just write Zafar Bengash and you will find him. And Zafar, on this matter of changing conditions, is it, I've, there are the rumors, so I wanna ask you about some of the rumors. There is a story, uh, that one of the problems of course Afghanistan had and countries in the region have had uh, due to, frankly, to the colonialist era, but you have what are called warlords. And there were a couple of warlords who were giving trouble to the Islamic Republic, uh, using people, uh, permitting people to from Afghanistan territory to try to create uh, terror and havoc in Iran. And I understand that the Taliban has shut them down. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there were uh, a number of warlords that, um, um, you know, that, that had existed in Afghanistan. And on the one hand, uh, the Americans, uh, when they went into Afghanistan, they said that they were going to uh, go after these warlords. Uh, but then they discovered that if they gave them uh, bags full of dollars, that they could buy these people and they could use them against uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran or against Pakistan. And that's unfortunately what they did. Uh, one of the things that I- I'm, That has come to an end, right? I mean, through exactly. Pakistan decision. Exactly, that has come to an end. In fact, uh, Ashraf Ghani, before uh, he fled the country, he tried to recruit some of these warlords uh, to support him. Uh, and one person in particular is, is quite notorious. His name is uh, Abdul Rashid Dostam. Oh and boy, I was going to ask you about him. Please go on. And he's an absolutely ruthless figure. In fact, in 2001, when the Americans attacked, there were several thousand Taliban uh, fighters uh, that were that surrendered, that dropped their weapons in a place called Mazar Sharif, which is in the north uh, of of Afghanistan. And what this guy did, Abdul Rashid Dostam, what he did was that uh, he uh, stuffed all of these uh, Taliban prisoners, and these are prisoners of war, into metal containers and locked them up over there for over several days. So many of them suffocated inside those metal containers. And then he ordered his own militia to start firing at these containers so that anybody that might perchance still be alive to be killed as well. So Dostum, who is an Uzbek warlord, perpetrated war crimes at the end of 2001. And this time when the Taliban went into Mazari Sharif, uh, Dostum as well as another warlord by the name of Noor Muhammad Atta, who was a Tajik warlord, instead of fighting, they fled into Uzbekistan because their own you know, militias refused to fight the Taliban. The Taliban had sent word to them telling these people that, you know, you shouldn't fight. So these warlords fled into Uzbekistan and now they are sheltering over there. Mm -hmm. A few days earlier, uh, in another province, a neighboring province, where uh, Dostum had a six-story palace uh, in a place called Shibarhan. When the Taliban took it over, I mean, there, there are videos available. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a massive structure, but decorated in the most vulgar manner, in the most obscene manner. Like, you know, it's so gaudy that, you know, it, it makes you throw up, uh, yeah. you know, the ostentatiousness of this, this building. And, you know, the kind of furniture that's there and the kind of decoration it is, it, it reflects a very poor taste. And, and but I mean, you don't expect anything better from people like Dostum. But he is one warlord. If the Taliban had captured, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I, they, I have to ask, interrupt. Did you say they've captured Dostum? 
no, they haven't. I said, oh. if they had captured him, <laughs> if they yeah. had captured him, I had my he, own. Yeah, he would be what he would be one person who would be exempt from Taliban's amnesty because he has a lot to answer for. And I'm pretty sure that they would have dealt with him publicly in a very severe manner because of the war crimes that that man uh, had committed and continued to commit. And he also stole hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, you know, we, unfortunately, Turkey is also, you know, supporting him. For many years, he was sheltered in, in Istanbul. He was given a, a huge palace over there that he lived in. And of course, you know, because he's of Uzbek origin, he has fled to Uzbekistan and that's where he is at the present time. And it's quite possible that from there, he might move to Turkey. But regrettably, that's one warlord that I would have liked to have seen captured. Well, so that he could I have to you, did you do his whereabouts, are his whereabouts known? Well, he is in Uzbekistan at the present time. Yes, he fled to Uzbekistan a few days ago. Uh, and and um, uh, it, did you say uh, it's Turkestan or no, Uzbekistan? Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, yes. Is there any hope that they might hold him? Uh, I doubt it very much, no, because these wow. various stans are also very nationalistic. But he also would be an American asset. Oh, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, how about the name Abu Omar Khorasani? Sharmin Narwani says he's been executed. He's an ISIS man. Yes, well, uh, you know, there are, you see, um, uh, a lot of um, uh, ISIS people that were brought uh, to Afghanistan by the Americans. I mean, even Hamid Karzai in a CBS uh, interview back in October of 2018, he publicly stated, he said that I have evidence that the Americans are bringing ISIS fighters from Syria into Afghanistan. He stated it on record. And so there is absolutely no doubt that these ISIS terrorists were brought into Afghanistan basically to create problems for and the it, Taliban. And the and, Taliban has captured him and apparently perhaps have executed him according to Sharmin Nawani. Well, if that is the case, that's very good news because these kinds of terrorists need to be dealt with immediately. They shouldn't be shown any mercy at all because these are really, really terrorists that terrorize civilians, that perpetrate horrible crimes, and that bring nothing but disrepute to the name of Islam because these are not uh, Muslims by their conduct. They may be Muslims by birth, but they don't conduct themselves in any way that Islam requires. So I'll have to check into that. But if that's the case, that I think is definitely good news that uh, Abu Omar Khorasani has been taken care of. Yeah, the, her, don't, uh, on her Twitter account, she writes, it executed former ISIS head of South Asia and Far East, Abu Omar, Omar Khorasani. The Taliban views ISIS as a deviant tool of the US-backed former government and claims the US brought them to Afghanistan, which you have just told us uh, that that is widely believed and understood, right, in Afghanistan. Yes, of course, yes. You know, uh, Zafar, it's beginning to sound more and more like Afghanistan has been overrun by Afghanis. <laughs> yes, of course, and that's such that's a- horrible. Terrible, that's such a terrible thing, I think you really and, need to. <laughs> they didn't say, may I? There's a kid's game. You're supposed to say, may I? before you do that, take over your own country. Yes. Isn't it time, by the way, Zafar, to say and remind everyone that the this whole thing has been terribly distorted by American egoism, arrogance, by saying that 9-11 was the greatest moment in history and that everybody had, to, there had to be a war on terror. The Islamic Republic responded positively to that, Syria, Libya and others said, yes, we have terrorists and we agree, and there has to be an international campaign to defeat it. And for about five or six years, many people, not the Islamic Republic, but many states bought into the idea, oh, we are all fighting it together. But the United States was actually organizing and using terrorists. And as you pointed out, they, they put them on a list, they take them off a list, they were playing games. It was a fraud, was it not? Absolutely. In fact, um, if we accept what the Americans uh, said about 9-11, although there are many people that question that, but let's 
except what the Americans said. They said that there were 19 hijackers of whom 15 were Saudis. There was not a single Afghan among them. Now, the question is Afghanistan, when in fact there was absolutely nothing that the Afghans had done. If they really wanted to avenge 9-11, according to their own account, they should have gone after the Saudis because there were 15 Saudis involved over there. Of course, the, Saudi, uh, the Americans say that, well, uh, this was orchest orchestrated by Osama bin Laden and he was being har harbored by uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. True, Osama bin Laden was in Afghanistan, but the Americans never officially charged Osama bin Laden with carrying out the 9-11 attacks or orchestrating them. No doubt, Osama bin Laden, after the 9-11 attacks, he said he was interviewed by a Pakistani journalist three days after the attacks. He said, I have nothing to do with it, but I welcome the attacks because this will teach Americans a lesson. Now, that's a view that many people around the world held because they felt that America needed to have his, its front teeth knocked out the way it was conducting itself. But aside from that, Osama bin Laden was never charged for this crime of 9-11. Now, no. And by the way, the method, there's two things to be said, I guess. One is, he's an old friend of the Americans. See, he was supported there. They, he went with them against the Russians. And, yeah. and, and the Taliban government of the time said, we will turn him over to you, but treat us like a government. We're a government. Show us the papers. We'll give him to you. And they wouldn't do it. Exactly. That was and then a, somehow he ends up in Pakistan. And Joe Biden the other day said, well, we got him. Well, you didn't get him in Afghanistan. You, yeah. you assassinated him. That's true. Which, by the way, that isn't really a way you did demonstrate somebody's guilty or something. You did kill him, but you didn't prove anything. Correct. There was actually uh, several um, episodes uh, when uh, Osama bin Laden was in Sudan, because there he had set up a pharmaceutical company that the Americans uh, actually bombed in 1998 uh, that was producing uh, malaria tablets. So basically, um, the, the struggle to eradicate malaria in Sudan and in North Africa was essentially destroyed by American cruise missiles. Now, in 1995, Osama bin Laden was in Sudan, and the Sudanese foreign minister contacted the United States government, and it told them, he told them that if you want Osama bin Laden, we can hand him over to you. America flatly refused. So this was 1995. Yeah, the wrong government at that time. They didn't like Sudan. Exactly. Then in... In 1996, after the Taliban came to power, Osama bin Laden moved to Afghanistan. And again, as you mentioned, when the Americans accused him of being involved in 9-11 attacks, the Afghan government at the time, led by the Taliban and the Taliban leader at the time, Mullah Omar, he sent a message to the Americans and said, if you say that Osama bin Laden was involved in it, could you please provide us some proof? And we would be more than happy to hand him over to you. But of course, the Americans were so full of themselves and so arrogant, they said, uh, how dare you ask us to provide you proof? Whatever we say is, is the law. And you, we are going to see you in, in Kabul. And so, of course, they, they saw the Taliban in Kabul. And now we have seen that the Taliban have seen off the Americans from Kabul. Yes. And, and that... Uh... The whole process was so corrupt. I mean, they on that matter, for example, when they said, show us, they weren't kidding. I mean, if they had said, uh, we can take him in custody, so we'll, and then we'll wait and see what you tell us. But they, you, you remember the phrase from the time, of, from, coming from, I think it was the Reagan administration or the Bush, I forget which, but they said, um, don't let a crisis go. Yeah, it was Bush. Don't let a crisis go to waste. This is great. We have now we can create homeland security and spy on every American. We can tap their phones. We can follow people around. 
we can create provocation and arrest people. And, and they did it. They were they actually exploited it instead of doing the reasonable thing. They said, well, we're not going to waste this crisis. Now we're going to attack Afghanistan and, of course, Iraq. Of course, you know, there is um, uh, a very important interview that um, General Wesley Clark, who was the former NATO commander um, in, in 1999, uh, an American general who had given an interview to Democracy Now! back in March of 2007. And in that interview, General Clark actually revealed that about a week or 10 days after the attacks of 9-11, he had gone to the Pentagon to meet uh, of course, uh, Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz, et cetera, these warlords, American warlords. And then on his way back from the top floor, on the way down, a, a general um, who had worked with General Clark called him to his office and said, uh, General, you have to see this. And he said, what is this? And he presented to him a piece of paper um, that had a list of seven countries on it, names of seven countries. And on top of that was Iraq, uh, and of course, a number of other countries, including Syria, Sudan, Lebanon, Libya, Iran, et cetera, these seven countries, Yemen. And yes. uh, the general told uh, General Wesley Clark that uh, the Pentagon or the US has decided to attack these countries. So General Clark said, I asked him, I said, well, have you found any connection between Iraq and Al Qaeda? He said, no, 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 there's nothing like that. He said, but then why are we going to attack Iraq? So he said, well, these people don't know what else to do. We have to do something. So we have decided to destroy seven countries. And if you look at America's record since that time, that's precisely what they went on to do, except that when they got to Syria, that's where they were stopped in their tracks. They yeah. failed. They have destroyed Libya. It is a failed state now. They have caused havoc in Iraq. They've been trying to destroy Yemen. They've already destroyed Yemen, but at least the Yemeni people have held their, their ground uh, and, and Lebanon and you know so many other countries. But because Syria held its ground and because countries like Iran and Hezbollah and uh, Russia uh, stood with Syria, they prevented this conspiracy uh, of another Arab country being destroyed. And so the American plan was basically frustrated in Syria. And, and it in fact made the resistance front uh, even stronger. But with respect to what the Americans did in the US and in fact, not just America, but all of its allies, I mean, look, look at the raft of laws that uh, you know, Western countries pass, these oppressive laws uh, to curtail people's freedoms, to you know, create these um, uh, very, uh, not only oppressive laws, but to give vast powers to their uh, security agencies, et cetera, to, to spy on people, to basically, you know, usurp their freedoms. That is where I think, you know, we, we went into this, this tailspin that was used, uh, the 9-11 the attacks were basically used as a pretext to take away people's hard-won freedoms. I think you said the magic word pretext, the excuse to unleash imperialist violence. Uh, Zafar Bengash, it's been a great treat. Obviously, we're going to have to stay very close to this because this is one of the big stories. So thank you very, very much. We look forward to talking to you soon. It's my great pleasure, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. CIT, Taylor Report.